Brilliant. Amazing. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today to be able to present to you guys in the revolution section, which feels really appropriate. Uh, not one, but, but two revolutions uh, in one talk. Uh, the first is a physical revolution. How our cities are changing, how street art is affecting public space and the walls in our cities. And then secondly, in the second half of this presentation, I'm going to invite to the stage my very good friend, Chu, to basically blow your minds with a new kind of technology, uh, Google Tilt Brush, and Chu is doing really amazing things with that. So, so the first thing, just to give you a little bit of an introduction about myself and our story, I have a split background. So on the one hand, uh, about 10 years ago, I used to break dance for the UK, I was traveling and competing, and on the other hand, I have a PhD in mathematical models of DNA evolution. Never sure quite how they work together. About 10 years ago, I tore my knee. I had to stop dancing overnight. And with all of that energy, I started running around the world and obsessively taking photographs of graffiti in hidden spaces. Took 60,000 photos in 25 countries and classified them like a scientist would. Uh, and learned a lot about street art and got to meet artists that way. Fast forward to 2012 and after some career missteps in finance and insurance, um, started Global Street Art. Uh, our mission is very simple. It's to live in painted cities. Um, that's, the why of, 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 uh, that's why we exist, and we achieve that mission by doing three different things. The first thing that we do is we promote street art and street artists online. Globalstreetart.com, we have 350,000 fans on social media. Artists upload their photographs to our website every day, and we share them with our fan base and drive them new fans online. The internet has been amazing for showing people how good street art can be because people share the best stuff, which is something to bear in mind later. The second thing that we do is a social side of what we do. Uh, we organize and arrange murals. Since 2012, we've organized over 1,500 legal street art murals in London, uh, including a program uh, that works with building sites, which we'll show you later, and also now starting to work more with housing estates. The third side of what we do is an agency. So we have a commercial agency that does things that I'll show you later, like hand-painted advertising, et cetera. This is the largest commercial mural in the UK, and that's up in Liverpool. I'm going to give you a very quick background to street art and graffiti, um, and just how it's changed. So whereas before, about 50 years ago, starting in the east coast of the States, graffiti was really on the side of trains. Um, and at that time, the train was essentially the internet, taking the image around the city, but now more and more people share their work online, and, and it's, not that street art, uh, it's not that graffiti has necessarily decreased, but it's certainly changed. When we use words like street art or graffiti, we actually mean three things in one now. There's an art form, a crime, and a subculture, and what we do is celebrate the art form um, without so much the crime. Our cities are changing, public space is changing, and, and maybe you've seen it and maybe you haven't noticed, but something really beautiful is going on, and our cities are being painted more. And that's for three key trends. The first one is that the art itself has changed. When you look at this next series of photos, please bear in mind that they're all called street art, but actually the differences between them is really vast. Most people, when they think of street art, they think of stencils um, and, and fairly kind of Banksy-esque sort of work. It's far, far broader than that. And there's artists out there today working with all manner of materials. Uh, and it's not just stencils, it can be just about any technique, as this installation by Akash Nihalani shows. Graffiti itself, writing your name, your chosen name, your letters, has become that much more, not necessarily bright and vibrant, but far more technical, as the materials have evolved with that as well. Now, street art is this catch-all term, as I mentioned, that includes many different art forms all rolled into the same, uh, the same name, street art. And that includes things like reinterpreting past masters, Inc includes works of high realism, um, painting things that are photorealistic. As well, sign writing, again, because of the impact of the internet and social media and sharing, has also uh, been reinvigorated and to some extent has been caught up um, and is now somewhat associated with street art culture as well. So sign writing, realism, works of giant scale calligraphy. This was a piece that we organized uh, in, in Camden by Mexican artist Saeed Dokins. And then even abstract works as well. So all of these things are very different. Um, all of these things are very different, but they're all called street art. Now the next set of photos comes mostly from our book, which came out a couple of years ago, and it shows 
how street art is different from gallery-based art. And of course, that's the context. The city is very different. Um, the type of space that you produce art or art is produced for affects the kind of work that's get, that, that goes there. So street art is really amazing at working with and complementing the spaces that you can find it by Russian artist Nomers. And again, the wall doesn't have to be straight, it doesn't have to be simple. Street art around the world can and does work on all manner of amazing surfaces, um, even bridges uh, and things like this. This is a piece from Germany. So again, I'm calling all of this street art, but it's really varied and the context is different. So that was trend one. The art itself has developed and evolved. Trend two is organization, and this is a really key trend. Around the world today, most cities, most major cities seem to have or do have their own street art festivals. These are just some examples, um, but we've lost track completely of how many major street art festivals there are in different cities around the world. Um, just to give you some examples of how we organize and what we do, uh, and and the, these are mirrored, these examples are mirrored by different programs in different cities around the world. But we have one program that works with building, uh, building sites specifically and property developers to turn building sites into curated art spaces. So again, another example of organization. Uh, and this is a new project um, where we've just completed the pilot in North London in Camden. We've organized 26 murals uh, painted by artists from all over the world um, in a housing estate. And it was kind of funded largely by the artists. Kodak came in and helped support with some of the murals, um, but also we kind of provided materials for that. And so these are just examples. And again, this is all part of that second trend, why street art is painting our cities, which is organization. So festivals, etc. cetera. Let's see if that works. Trend three is enterprise. Because now there's more ways of artists being able to work doing things that are related to painting because of sharing on social media, again, there's more ways in which uh, street art can develop and is helping paint our cities. So these are some of the examples of what we do. Um, but again, mirrored all over the world. So I give these examples because they're most familiar to us, but this is happening everywhere. So one of the things that we do and work on is, is hand paint and advertising. This was a project for Sony Xperia last year, or two years ago, where all of the murals were painted with uh, UV paint, and then we shone lights on them at night to change their color. You can imagine how that can be used to generate content for social media. Um, other examples from the floor pieces, et cetera, these are all things that we do that can be done, again, providing more opportunities um, for artists to, to make a living and work for artists outside the traditional gallery system, print production, et cetera. Um, this was this building. This, this slide was actually in by accident, but we painted here East uh, a couple of years ago. This hoarding doesn't exist anymore. Um, but again, it's about placemaking. So as well as the advertising, as well as some other aspects, um, property developers are increasingly keen to be involved to help kind of bring culture and life to their spaces, so placemaking. Interiors as well, and then licensing. So because we've got this amazing network of artists all around the world, because we help lots of people come to London and paint, it kind of leads to these extra opportunities in terms of an agency. So these are the three key trends why our cities are being more painted. Not only has the art evolved that much more, is being shared more on social media, creating new fans, but there's also increasing organization around street art, uh, especially street art festivals, which are helping put large murals in particular in different cities around the world. And then the third trend is that enterprise, where uh, artists have got more opportunities to make a living doing something related to uh, their passions, um, which are leading, helping to see our cities more painted. So it was a loaded question before. Um, it's not so much that our cities, will they be painted more in future? It's already happening. 10 years ago, there were no real, very few street art festivals around the world, and today there's literally hundreds. So the question is not, will our cities be painted more in future? They will be, but the question is how much? And that's the interesting thing that we think is working really hard for. Now, related to what we're doing has been, um, if I can bring you to the stage, Chu. Can we give a, a little round of applause for Chu, who brings to the stage? Um, artists that have come from a street art background are often uniquely placed to test, try, and really further technology. Um, if we can swap over to uh, when he's ready, um, Chu's screen, and then we're going to start a time lapse. Let me introduce Chu, who's um, a, a phenomenal artist that I've known for many years. The, the first way that I even heard about Chu before we met is Chu had built an art installation which was a box. Uh, and if you're familiar with early forms of 3D where you would have the red line or the red lens and the blue lens, Chu recreated uh, a stereoscopic installation of his mum's kitchen by holding a can of red paint, a can of blue paint, and in his mind just compensating 
for the width of the lines, which still blows my mind today. The second thing, uh, the first time I actually saw Chu's work, he'd somehow painted an embedded stereo in the ground that looked like it was breaking out, and it was amazing. Um, and we've worked together on projects including this before, uh, including Tilt Brush. Chu was one of the first artists selected by Google's Cultural Institute in Paris to really try and break the technology. And in fact, Chu did break that technology um, and has been using it ever since. Um, Chu's been painting for 35 years. Uh, kind of career highlights include um, teaching art to students, uh, to, teaching graffiti to art students in Kabul, Afghanistan, um, painting a 10 carriage train. Uh, for guerrillas artist Jamie Hewlett. And he was also, she was also instrumental and pivotal in the launch of a certain famous artist career at Banksy and then worked with him for 12 years roughly afterwards. Um, so that's to introduce you to as you're playing your time lapse. Um, <laughs> I'm going to now ask some questions and kind of hand over to Chu as Thanks, well. Lee. So, Chu, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, yeah, as you've heard, I'm, I'm of a certain age. Um, and this is a piece that uh, it took about four days to create and all, but as you probably can't tell, all of the city here is uh, freehand drawn. And this is one of the great things with this device, the Tiltbrush software and the Vive, is that it celebrates freehand drawing as opposed to computer modeling or uh, structured geometric techniques. So all these lines, all the surfaces you see in this, other than the obvious uh, logos, every surface has been freehand drawn within the Tilbrush software, and it's a, you know, a sizable cityscape. Um, and this is basically a surface for further destruction to occur. So. Uh, I'm not too sure how many of you have used Tiltbrush or have you know, seen it in action. By show of hands, how many people here have used Tiltbrush before? It's probably about less than 10% of the audience. Less it's going to be right, very okay. different by the end of today. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've got it set up in the, uh, in the other room, so if you want to come by and have a play, by all means, come along. Uh, this is all um, constructed by these controllers. These controllers very similar to the aerosol can in terms of you can vary the amount of colour going into the work with certain brushes and obviously select any colour and there's, there's, there, there are so many brushes to choose from although this city is constructed in the main with, as you can probably tell if I close in, they're made up of flat surfaces so, Chu, can you show us some of the tools that you use to create this? Yeah, let me just uh, finish loading this, because some of it's still being built, as you can tell, there's some time lapse going on. I shall advance that, if you bear with me, so that it's completed. So, so this is a cityscape that Chu built called Chutopia that was put <laughs> yeah. together in only four days, which is amazing. Um, so, Chu, if you can just show us some of the tools then as you yeah. move around. <laughs> So, yeah, this is all, as I said, built with a flat brush. And as you can see, there's various brushes to choose from. This is the flat brush. I'll just illustrate how you use that. You can obviously use it freehand, like it's a paint. But there's various additional tools, like straight edge. So you can literally mark a line, start and end, and you end up with a straight edge. And you can obviously walk around the thing, which is uh, you know, fantastic to be able to do. But the other brushes, the reason why this city looks kind of flat, literally, and uh, not bearing too much vibrance is because it allows for the addition or the destruction of this with illumination. And just as an example, um, pick your colour, and then any light in the scene is obviously more, you know, it, the contrast. So I designed the city really to be vandalised. So, um, with, with permission, of course, um, um, just some of the other brushes, uh, there's fantastical tools like this Toon brush, for example, puts a little black edge on the, on the artwork. So, if you do lettering, it kind of has the look, it's a cartoony look. Um, yeah. Chu, can you... Um can you show us how you play with scale? Yeah, of course. Well, 
That's just illustrating the... The, norm, the new normal. Yeah. Ooh, you've got to be careful with the stage. Two seconds, yeah. So, as you uh, enlarge the scene, there's a new uh, meter that informs you just what scale you're actually viewing it. So, that is obviously a squirrel scale. Um, <laughs> and that, that is basically, you are a tiny squirrel in this gigantic city, which allows you to see some of the incongruences in the layout, but then you can become an elephant or Brontosaurus, in case none of you knew what that was. <laughs> Brontosaurus, and that allows you to view the whole thing as a, a miniature model. And also what this allows you to do is when you get to the size of a squirrel, when you draw with a big brush and then scale back down, the artwork shrinks as well until it's barely visible, you see? Hmm. And so you can, as any designer or artist will tell you, if you produce work of scale, large scale, and then reduce it down, the clarity improves. So this is another great addition to the tool sets introduced by Google. And the updates are coming thick and fast. I mean, I've had the equipment for four months, and there's an average of about two weeks, two to three weeks, there's an update. Started on version 1.2, now it's on version 7.5. So, Chu, um, just to check a question at you, how has your other art or your graffiti kind of prepared you for working in this environment? Well, 3D anyway has been a massive part of the work I do. Um, I began when I was seven making stereoscopic artwork with the anaglyphic uh, red and blue lenses. And so that gave me a little insight into how dimension can be, you know, influence the audience as to how they see the work. Um, I also started uh, working with CGI when I, I was working in video games, constructing characters and backgrounds and various um, GUIs. Uh, so that obvious, obviously is, you know, prompting me to take on any digital uh, artwork and tools that I can lay my hands on. And this is literally laying your hands on it because you don't, you know, there's no mouse, there's no keyboard. This is, you know, the most natural method of creating artwork. And as you can probably tell, the angle of my brush is actually set as similarly as possible to an aerosol can. So the usual angle is to, yeah, it's a slightly technical, I'll show you outside if you want to come and uh, have a little go yourself, but I've basically set the whole system up so that I can use it similar to aerosol paint. And this is now, this working tilbush is now influencing the work I'm doing on walls. So it's all, all of the work, all the tools I use, all of the software and hardware is now helping me to paint walls with the brush and up a ladder, so the, 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 the analog world is getting influenced by the digital world. Um, so when we present this uh, as a technology, it's good fun to see if we can kind of solve people's problems, is how we ask, but we're a bit distant from you guys. So what we've done previously is we've asked people uh, for some issues that they're trying to solve and problems that they're having potentially, um, uh, and try and ask Chu to, to solve them live. So. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start with some that we, we asked before, which is a, an example. Um, Chu, uh, I'm having trouble seeing in the dark. Can you help me? I certainly can, Lee. Uh, let's see how we can do this. Okay. Will that help? <laughs> a 24 story carrot. <laughs> um, Any other problems? We had a, a question because it was an award ceremony. Um, what should I do if I win an award? Um, we can see to that. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Just get another colour here. As you can tell, you can 
actually use it a bit like toothpaste, toothpaste this, uh, this brush. It's quite lovely. You can get a thin start and then a thick end. And let's put some... Let's just give this a bit of life. And some of these brushes are actually animated. So you can actually... The, the, the flame, if I just get that, you can see... But well, that's what I'd do if I so won. So you baked a cake. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. The follow-on question then was, uh, what should I do if I don't win an award? <laughs> <laughs> make a wish. Yeah, to make a wish for next time. <laughs> Amazing. Um, let's go for one more. Um, what happens if there's a crime? <sighs> wow. It was actually the question is if I get my bag stolen. One thing we could do is look up here. Oh. And <laughs> you could probably tell all the fans in the room. There you go. A massive um, a round of applause for you. I can't even see where that's I'm looking. Eh? <laughs> um, so we're going to be outside for the rest of the day. For everyone that's not seen or played with Tilt Rush, you'll be able to immerse yourself in Utopia uh, for yourselves. Um, and you can come. We'll be here until 5 o'clock. Uh, Chu, the last thing I need to ask you is, uh, shall we get out of here? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>